Man Who Went Too Far by E. F. Benson Read by Richard Crowest The little village of St. Faith's nestles in a hollow of wooded hill up on the north bank of the River Fawn in the county of Hampshire, huddling close round its grey Norman church as if for spiritual protection against the fays and fairies, the trolls and little people who might be supposed still to linger in the vast empty spaces of the new forest, and to come after dusk and do their doubtful business. Once outside the hamlet, you may walk in any direction, so long as you avoid the high road which leads to Brockenhurst, for the length of a summer afternoon without seeing sign of human habitation, or possibly even catching sight of another human being. Shaggy, wild ponies may stop their feeding for a moment as you pass. The white scuts of rabbits will vanish into their burrows. A brown viper, perhaps, will glide from your path into a clump of heather, and unseen birds will chuckle in the bushes but it may easily happen that for a long day you will see nothing human. But you will not feel in the least lonely. In summer, at any rate, the sunlight will be gay with butterflies, and the air thick with all those woodland sounds which, like instruments in an orchestra, combine to play the great symphony of the yearly festival of June. Winds whisper in the birches and sigh among the firs. Bees are busy with their redolent labour among the heather, a myriad birds chirp in the green temples of the forest trees, and the voice of the river, prattling over stony places, bubbling into pools, chuckling and gulping round corners, gives you the sense that many presences and companions are near at hand. Yet, oddly enough, though one would have thought that these benign and cheerful influences of wholesome air and spaciousness of forest were very healthful comrades for a man, in so far as nature can really influence this wonderful human genus which has in these centuries learned to defy her most violent storms in its well-established houses, to bridle her torrents and make them light its streets, to tunnel her mountains and plough her seas, the inhabitants of St. Faith's will not willingly venture into the forest after dark. For in spite of the silence and loneliness of the hooded night, it seems that a man is not sure in what company he may suddenly find himself. And though it is difficult to get from these villagers any very clear story of occult appearances, the feeling is widespread. One story, indeed, I have heard with some definiteness, the tale of a monstrous goat that has been seen to skip with hellish glee about the woods and shady places, and this perhaps is connected with the story which I have here attempted to piece together. It too is well known to them, for all remember the young artist who died here not long ago, a young man, or so he struck the beholder, of great personal beauty, with something about him that made men's faces to smile and brighten when they looked on him. His ghost, they will tell you, walks constantly by the stream and through the woods which he loved so, and in especial it haunts a certain house, the last of the village, where he lived, and its garden, in which he was done to death. For my part I am inclined to think that the terror of the forest dates chiefly from that day. So, such as the story is, I have set it forth in connected form. It is based partly on the accounts of the villagers, but mainly on that of Darcy, a friend of mine, and a friend of the man with whom these events were chiefly concerned. The day had been one of untarnished midsummer splendour, and as the sun drew near to its setting, the glory of the evening grew every moment more crystalline, more miraculous. Westward from St Faith's, the beech wood, which stretched for some miles towards the heathery upland beyond, already cast its veil of clear shadow over the red roofs of the village, but the spire of the grey church, overtopping all, still pointed a flaming orange finger into the sky. The river form, which runs below, lay in sheets of sky-reflected blue, and wound its dreamy, devious course round the edge of this wood, where a rough, two-planked bridge crossed from the bottom of the garden of the last house in the village, and communicated by means of a little wicker gate with the wood itself. 
Then, once out of the shadow of the wood, the stream lay in flaming pools of the molten crimson of the sunset, and lost itself in the haze of woodland distances. This house at the end of the village stood outside the shadow, and the lawn which sloped down to the river was still flecked with sunlight. Garden beds of dazzling colour lined its gravel walks, and down the middle of it ran a brick pergola, half hidden in clusters of rambler rose and purple with starry clematis. At the bottom end of it, between two of its pillars, was slung a hammock containing a shirt-sleeved figure. The house itself lay somewhat remote from the rest of the village, and a footpath leading across two fields, now tall and fragrant with hay, was its only communication with the high road. It was low-built, only two storeys in height, and, like the garden, its walls were a mass of flowering roses. A narrow stone terrace ran along the garden front, over which was stretched an awning, and on the terrace a young, silent-footed manservant was busied with the laying of the table for dinner. He was neat-handed and quick with his job, and having finished it he went back into the house and reappeared again with a large, rough bath-towel on his arm. With this he went to the hammock in the pergola. "'Nearly eight, sir,' he said. "'Has Mr. Darcy come yet?' asked a voice from the hammock. "'No, sir. "'If I'm not back when he comes, tell him that I'm just having a bathe before dinner.' The servant went back to the house, and after a moment or two Frank Halton struggled to a sitting posture and slipped out onto the grass. He was of medium height and rather slender in build, but the supple ease and grace of his movements gave the impression of great physical strength. Even his descent from the hammock was not an awkward performance. His face and hands were of very dark complexion, either from constant exposure to wind and sun, or as his black hair and dark eyes tended to show, from some strain of southern blood. His head was small, his face of an exquisite beauty of modelling, while the smoothness of its contour would have led you to believe that he was a beardless lad still in his teens. But something, some look which living and experience alone can give, seemed to contradict that, and finding yourself completely puzzled as to his age, you would next moment probably cease to think about that, and only look at this glorious specimen of young manhood with wondering satisfaction. He was dressed as became the season and the heat, and wore only a shirt open at the neck and a pair of flannel trousers. His head, covered very thickly with a somewhat rebellious crop of short curly hair, was bare as he strolled across the lawn to the bathing place that lay below. Then, for a moment, there was silence, then the sound of splashed and divided waters, and presently after a great shout of ecstatic joy as he swam upstream with the foamed water standing in a frill round his neck. Then, after some five minutes of limb-stretching struggle with the flood, he turned over on his back, and with arms thrown wide floated downstream, ripple-cradled and inert. His eyes were shut, and between half-parted lips he talked gently to himself. "'I am one with it,' he said to himself. "'The river and I, I and the river. "'The coolness and splash of it is I, "'and the water-herbs that wave in it are I also, "'and my strength and my limbs are not mine but the rivers. "'It is all one, all one, dear fawn.' A quarter of an hour later he appeared again at the bottom of the lawn, dressed as before, his wet hair already drying into its crisp, short curls again. There he paused a moment, looking back at the stream with the smile with which men look on the face of a friend, then turned towards the house. Simultaneously his servant came to the door leading on to the terrace, followed by a man who appeared to be some halfway through the fourth decade of his years. Frank and he saw each other across the bushes and garden beds, and each quickening his step they met suddenly face to face round an angle of the garden walk, in the fragrance of syringa. "'My dear Darcy,' cried Frank, "'I am charmed to see you.' But the other stared at him in amazement. "'Frank?' he exclaimed. 
"'Yes, that is my name,' he said, laughing. "'What is the matter?' Darcy took his hand. "'What have you done to yourself?' he asked. "'You are a boy again.' Uh, "'I have a lot to tell you,' said Frank. "'Lots that you will hardly believe, but I shall convince you.' He broke off suddenly and held up his hand. "'Hush, there is my nightingale,' he said. The smile of recognition and warmth with which he had greeted his friend faded from his face, and a look of rapt wonder took its place, as of a lover listening to the voice of his beloved. His mouth parted slightly, showing the white line of teeth, and his eyes looked out and out till they seemed to Darcy to be focused on things beyond the vision of man. Then something perhaps startled the bird, for the song ceased. Yes, lots to tell you, he said. Really, I am delighted to see you. But you look rather white and pulled down. No wonder after that fever. And there is to be no nonsense about this visit. It is June now. You will stop here till you are fit to begin work again. Two months at least. Oh, I can't trespass quite to that extent. Frank took his arm and walked him down the grass. Trespass? Who talks of trespass? I shall tell you quite openly when I am tired of you. But you know when we had the studio together we used not to bore each other. However, it is ill talking of going away on the moment of your arrival. Just a stroll to the river and then it will be dinner time. Darcy took out his cigarette case and offered it to the other. Frank laughed. <laughs> not for me. Dear me, I suppose I used to smoke once. How very odd. Given it up? I don't know. I suppose I must have. Anyway, I don't do it now. I would as soon think of eating meat. Another victim on the smoking altar of vegetarianism. Victim? asked Frank. Do I strike you as such? He paused on the margin of the stream and whistled softly. Next moment a moorhen made its splashing flight across the river and ran up the bank. Frank took it very gently in his hands and stroked its head as the creature lay against his shirt. "'And is the house among the reeds still secure?' he half crooned to it. "'And is the missus quite well? And are the neighbours flourishing?' "'There, dear, home with you.' And he flung it into the air. "'That bird's very tame,' said Darcy, slightly bewildered. "'It is, rather,' said Frank, following its flight." During dinner, Frank chiefly occupied himself in bringing himself up to date in the movements and achievements of this old friend whom he had not seen for six years. Those six years, it now appeared, had been full of incident and success for Darcy. He had made a name for himself as a portrait painter, which bade fair to outlast the vogue of a couple of seasons, and his leisure time had been brief. Then, some four months previously, he had been through a severe attack of typhoid, the result of which, as concerns this story, was that he had come down to this sequestered place to recruit. "'Yes, you've got on,' said Frank at the end. "'I always knew you would. A.R.A. with more in prospect. Money? You roll in it, I suppose. And, oh, Darcy, how much happiness have you had all those years? That is the only imperishable possession. And how much have you learned?' Oh, I don't mean in art. Even I could have done well in that. Darcy laughed. Done well? My dear fellow, all I have learned in these six years, you knew, so to speak, in your cradle. Your old pictures fetch huge prices. Do you never paint now? Frank shook his head. No, I'm too busy, he said. Doing what? Please tell me. That's what everyone is forever asking me. Doing? I suppose you would say I do nothing. Darcy glanced up at the brilliant young face opposite him. It seems to suit you that way of being busy, he said. Now, it's your turn. Do you read? Do you study? I remember you saying that it would do us all, all us artists, I mean, a great deal of good if we would study any one human face carefully for a year without recording a line. Have you been doing that? Frank shook his head again. I mean exactly what I say, 
he said. I have been doing nothing, and I have never been so occupied. Look at me. Have I not done something to myself to begin with? You are two years younger than I, said Darcy. At least you used to be. You, therefore, are thirty-five. But had I never seen you before, I should say you were just twenty. But was it worth while to spend six years of greatly occupied life in order to look twenty? Seems rather like a woman of fashion. Frank laughed boisterously. First time I've ever been compared to that particular bird of prey, he said. No, that has not been my occupation. In fact, I am only very rarely conscious that one effect of my occupation has been that. Of course, it must have been, if one comes to think of it. It is not very important. Quite true, my body has become young, but that is very little. I have become young. Darcy pushed back his chair and sat sideways to the table, looking at the other. Has that been your occupation, then? he asked. Yes, that anyhow is one aspect of it. Think what youth means. It is the capacity for growth. Mind, body, spirit, all grow, all get stronger, all have a fuller, firmer life every day. That is something, considering that every day that passes after the ordinary man reaches the full-blown flower of his strength weakens his hold on life. A man reaches his prime and remains, we say, in his prime for ten years or perhaps twenty, but after his primest prime is reached, he slowly, insensibly weakens. These are the signs of age in you, in your body, in your art, probably, in your mind. You are less electric than you were. But I, when I reach my prime, I am nearing it. Ah, you shall see. The stars had begun to appear in the blue velvet of the sky, and to the east the horizon seen above the black silhouette of the village was growing dove-coloured with the approach of moonrise. White moths hovered dimly over the garden beds, and the footsteps of night tiptoed through the bushes. Suddenly Frank rose. Ah, it is the supreme moment, he said softly. Now more than at any other time the current of life, the eternal imperishable current, runs so close to me that I am almost enveloped in it. Be silent a minute. He advanced to the edge of the terrace and looked out, standing stretched with arms outspread. Darcy heard him draw a long breath into his lungs, and after many seconds expel it again. Six or eight times he did this, then turned back into the lamplight. It will sound to you quite mad, I expect, but if you want to hear the soberest truth I have ever spoken and shall ever speak, I will tell you about myself. But come into the garden if it is not too damp for you. I have never told anyone yet, but I shall like to tell you. It is long, in fact, since I have even tried to classify what I have learned. They wandered down into the fragrant dimness of the pergola and sat down. Then Frank began. Years ago, do you remember, he said, we often used to talk about the decay of joy in the world. Many impulses we settled had contributed to this decay, some of which were good in themselves, others that were quite completely bad. Among the good things I put what we may call certain Christian virtues, renunciation, resignation, sympathy with suffering, and the desire to relieve sufferers. But out of those things spring very bad ones, useless renunciations, asceticism for its own sake, mortification of the flesh with nothing to follow, no corresponding gain, that is and that awful and terrible disease which devastated England some centuries ago, and from which by heredity of spirit we suffer now, Puritanism. That was a dreadful plague. The brutes held and taught that joy and laughter and merriment were evil. It was a doctrine the most profane and wicked. Why, what is the commonest crime one sees? A sullen face. That is the truth of the matter. 
Now, all my life I have believed that we are intended to be happy, that joy is of all gifts the most divine. And when I left London, abandoned my career such as it was, I did so because I intended to devote my life to the cultivation of joy, and by continuous and unsparing effort to be happy. Among people and in constant intercourse with others, I did not find it possible. And there were too many distractions in towns and workrooms, and also too much suffering. So I took one step backwards, or forwards as you may choose to put it, and went straight to nature. To trees, birds, animals, all those things which quite clearly pursue one aim only, which blindly follow the great native instinct to be happy without any care at all for morality, or human law, or divine law. I wanted, you understand, to get all joy first-hand and unadulterated, and I think it scarcely exists among men. It is obsolete. Darcy turned in his chair. Ah, but what makes birds and animals happy? he asked. Food. <laughs> Food and mating. Frank laughed gently in the stillness. <laughs> Do not think I became a sensualist, he said. I did not make that mistake. For the sensualist carries his misery's picker back, and round his feet is wound the shroud that shall soon enwrap him. I may be mad, it is true, but I am not so stupid anyhow as to have tried that. No, what is it that makes puppies play with their own tails, that sends cats on their prowling ecstatic errands at night? He paused a moment. So I went to nature, he said. I sat down here in this new forest, sat down fair and square, and looked. That was my first difficulty, to sit here quiet without being bored, to wait without being impatient, to be receptive and very alert, though for a long time nothing particular happened. The change, in fact, was slow in those early stages. Nothing happened? asked Darcy rather impatiently, with the sturdy revolt against any new idea which to the English mind is synonymous with nonsense. Why, what in the world should happen? Now, Frank, as he had known him, was the most generous but most quick-tempered of mortal men. In other words, his anger would flare to a prodigious beacon under almost no provocation, only to be quenched again under a gust of no less impulsive kindliness. Thus, the moment Darcy had spoken, an apology for his hasty question was halfway up his tongue, but there was no need for it to have travelled even so far, for Frank laughed again with kindly, genuine mirth. <laughs> oh, I know I should have resented that a few years ago, he said. Thank goodness that resentment is one of the things I have got rid of. I certainly wish that you should believe my story. In fact, you are going to. But that you at this moment should imply that you do not, does not concern me. Ah, your solitary sojournings have made you inhuman, said Darcy, still very English. No, human, said Frank. Rather more human, at least rather less of an ape. Well, that was my first quest, he continued after a moment. The deliberate and unswerving pursuit of joy, and by method the eager contemplation of nature. As far as motive went, I dare say it was purely selfish, but as far as effect goes, it seems to me about the best thing one can do for one's fellow creatures, for happiness is more infectious than smallpox. So, as I said, I sat down and waited. I looked at happy things, zealously avoided the sight of anything unhappy, and by degrees a little trickle of the happiness of this blissful world began to filter into me. The trickle grew more abundant, and now, my dear fellow, if I could for a moment divert from me into you one half of the torrent of joy that pours through me day and night, you would throw the world, art, everything aside, and just live, exist. When a man's body dies, it passes into trees and flowers. Well, that is what I have been trying to do with my soul before death. The servant had brought into the pergola a table with siphons and spirits, and had set a lamp upon it. As Frank spoke, he leaned forward towards the other, and Darcy, for all his matter-of-fact common sense, 
could have sworn that his companion's face shone, was luminous in itself. His dark brown eyes glowed from within. The unconscious smile of a child irradiated and transformed his face. Darcy felt suddenly excited, exhilarated. Go on, he said. Go on, I can feel you are telling me sober truth. I dare say you are mad, but I don't see that matters. Frank laughed again. <laughs> mad, he said. Yes, certainly, if you wish, but I prefer to call it sane. However, nothing matters less than what anybody chooses to call things. God never labels his gifts. He just puts them into our hands, just as he put animals in the Garden of Eden for Adam to name if he felt disposed. So, by the continual observance and study of things that were happy, continued he, I got happiness, I got joy. But seeking it as I did from nature, I got much more which I did not seek, but stumbled upon originally by accident. It is difficult to explain, but I will try. About three years ago I was sitting one morning in a place I will show you tomorrow. It is down by the river bank, very green, dappled with shade and sun, and the river passes there through some little clumps of reeds. Well, as I sat there, doing nothing but just looking and listening, I heard the sound quite distinctly of some flute-like instrument playing a strange, unending melody. I thought at first it was some musical yokel on the highway and did not pay much attention, but before long the strangeness and indescribable beauty of the tune struck me. It never repeated itself, but it never came to an end. Phrase after phrase ran its sweet course. It worked gradually and inevitably up to a climax, and, having attained it, it went on. Another climax was reached, and another, and another. Then, with a sudden gasp of wonder, I localised where it came from. It came from the reeds, and from the sky, and from the trees. It was everywhere. It was the sound of life. It was, my dear Darcy, as the Greeks would have said, it was Pan playing on his pipes, the voice of nature. It was the life melody, the world melody. Darcy was far too interested to interrupt, though there was a question he would have liked to ask, and Frank went on. Well, for the moment I was terrified, terrified with the impotent horror of nightmare, and I stopped my ears and just ran from the place and got back to the house, panting, trembling literally in a panic. Unknowingly, for at that time I only pursued joy, I had begun, since I drew my joy from nature, to get in touch with nature. Nature, force, God, call it what you will, had drawn across my face a little gossamer web of essential life. I saw that when I emerged from my terror, and I went very humbly back to where I had heard the panpipes. But it was nearly six months before I heard them again. Why was that? asked Darcy. Surely because I had revolted, rebelled, and worst of all been frightened. For I believe that just as there is nothing in the world which so injures one's body as fear, so there is nothing that so much shuts up the soul. I was afraid, you see, of the one thing in the world which has real existence. No wonder its manifestation was withdrawn. And after six months? After six months, one blessed morning I heard the piping again. I wasn't afraid that time. And since then, it has grown louder. It has become more constant. I now hear it often, and I can put myself into such an attitude towards nature that the pipes will almost certainly sound. And never yet have they played the same tune. It is always something new, something fuller, richer, more complete than before. What do you mean by such an attitude towards nature? asked Darcy. I can't explain that, but by translating it into a bodily attitude, it is this. Frank sat up for a moment quite straight in his chair, then slowly sunk back with arms outspread and head drooped. That, he said, an 
effortless attitude, but open, resting, receptive. It is just that which you must do with your soul. Then he sat up again. One word more, he said, and I will bore you no further, nor, unless you ask me questions, shall I talk about it again. You will find me, in fact, quite sane in my mode of life. Birds and beasts you will see behaving somewhat intimately to me, like that moorhen, but that is all. I will walk with you, ride with you, play golf with you, and talk with you on any subject you like. But I wanted you on the threshold to know what has happened to me. And one thing more will happen. He paused again, and a slight look of fear crossed his eyes. There will be a final revelation, he said, a complete and blinding stroke which will throw open to me once and for all the full knowledge, the full realisation and comprehension that I am one, just as you are, with life. In reality there is no me, no you, no it. Everything is part of the one and only thing which is life. I know that that is so, but the realisation of it is not yet mine. But it will be, and on that day, so I take it, I shall see Pan. It may mean death, the death of my body, that is, but I don't care. It may mean immortal, eternal life, lived here and now and for ever. Then, having gained that, Ah, oh, my dear Darcy, I shall preach such a gospel of joy, showing myself as the living proof of the truth, that Puritanism, the dismal religion of sour faces, shall vanish like a breath of smoke and be dispersed and disappear in the sunlit air. But first, the full knowledge must be mine. Darcy watched his face narrowly. You are afraid of that moment, he said. Frank smiled at him. Quite true. You are quick to have seen that. But when it comes, I hope I shall not be afraid. For some little time there was silence. Then Darcy rose. You have bewitched me, you extraordinary boy, he said. You've been telling me a fairy story, and I find myself saying, Promise me it is true. I promise you that, said the other. And I know I shan't sleep, added Darcy. Frank looked at him with a sort of mild wonder, as if he scarcely understood. Well, what does that matter, he said. I assure you it does. I am wretched unless I sleep. Of course, I can make you sleep if I want, said Frank in a rather bored voice. Well, do. Very good. Go to bed. I'll come upstairs in ten minutes. Frank busied himself for a little after the other had gone, moving the table back under the awning of the veranda and quenching the lamp. Then he went with his quick, silent tread upstairs and into Darcy's room. The latter was already in bed, but very wide-eyed and wakeful, and Frank, with an amused smile of indulgence as for a fretful child, sat down on the edge of the bed. "'Look at me,' he said, and Darcy looked. "'The birds are sleeping in the brake," said Frank softly, "'and the winds are asleep. The sea sleeps, and the tides are but the heaving of its breast.' The stars swing slow, rocked in the great cradle of the heavens, and... He stopped suddenly, gently blew out Darcy's candle, and left him sleeping. Morning brought to Darcy a flood of hard common sense, as clear and crisp as the sunshine that filled his room. Slowly as he woke he gathered together the broken threads of the memories of the evening which had ended, so he told himself, in a trick of common hypnotism. And that accounted for it all. The whole strange talk he had had was under a spell of suggestion from the extraordinary vivid boy who had once been a man. All his own excitement, his acceptance of the incredible, had been merely the effect of a stronger, more potent will, 
imposed on his own. How strong that will was, he guessed from his own instantaneous obedience to Frank's suggestion of sleep. And, armed with impenetrable common sense, he came down to breakfast. Frank had already begun, and was consuming a large plateful of porridge and milk with the most prosaic and healthy appetite. "'Slept well?' he asked. "'Yes, of course. Where did you learn hypnotism?' "'By the side of the river.' "'You talked an amazing quantity of nonsense last night,' remarked Darcy, in a voice prickly with reason. "'Rather. I felt quite giddy. "'Look, I remembered to order a dreadful daily paper for you. "'You can read about money markets or politics or cricket matches.' "'Darcy looked at him closely. "'In the morning light, Frank looked even fresher, younger, "'more vital than he had done the night before.' and the sight of him somehow dinted Darcy's armour of common sense. "'You are the most extraordinary fellow I ever saw,' he said. "'I want to ask you some more questions.' "'Ask away,' said Frank. For the next day or two Darcy plied his friend with many questions, objections and criticisms on the theory of life, and gradually got out of him a coherent and complete account of his experience. In brief, then, Frank believed that, by lying naked, as he put it, to the force which controls the passage of the stars, the breaking of a wave, the budding of a tree, the love of a youth and maiden, he had succeeded in a way hitherto undreamed of in possessing himself of the essential principle of life. Day by day, so he thought, he was getting nearer to and in closer union with the great power itself which caused all life to be, the spirit of nature, of force, or the spirit of God. For himself he confessed to what others would call paganism. It was sufficient for him that there existed a principle of life. He did not worship it, he did not pray to it, he did not praise it. Some of it existed in all human beings just as it existed in trees and animals. To realise and make living to himself the fact that it was all one was his sole aim and object. Here, perhaps Darcy would put in a word of warning. Take care, he said. To see Pan meant death, did it not? Frank's eyebrows would rise at this. What does that matter, he said. True, the Greeks were always right, and they said so. But there is another possibility. For the nearer I get to it, the more living, the more vital and young I become. What, then, do you expect the final revelation will do for you? I have told you, he said. It will make me immortal. But it was not so much from speech and argument that Darcy grew to grasp his friend's conception as from the ordinary conduct of his life. They were passing, for instance, one morning down the village street, when an old woman, very bent and decrepit, but with an extraordinary cheerfulness of face, hobbled out from her cottage. Frank instantly stopped when he saw her. "'You old darling, how goes it all?' he said. But she did not answer. Her old, dim eyes were riveted on his face. She seemed to drink in, like a thirsty creature, the beautiful radiance which shone there. Suddenly she put her two withered old hands on his shoulders. "'You're just the sunshine itself,' she said. And he kissed her, and passed on. But scarcely a hundred yards further a strange contradiction of such tenderness occurred. A child running along the path towards them fell on its face and set up a dismal cry of fright and pain. A look of horror came into Frank's eyes, and, putting his fingers in his ears, he fled at full speed down the street and did not pause till he was out of hearing. Darcy, having ascertained that the child was not really hurt, followed him in bewilderment. "'Are you without pity, then?' he asked. Frank shook his head impatiently. "'Can't you see?' he asked. "'Can't you understand that that sort of thing, pain, anger, anything unlovely, throws me back, retards the coming of the great hour? Perhaps when it comes I shall be able to piece that side of life onto the other, onto the true religion of joy. At present I can't. But the old woman, was she not ugly?' Frank's radiance gradually returned. 
Uh, no, she was like me. She longed for joy, and she knew it when she saw it, the old darling. Another question suggested itself. Then what about Christianity? asked Darcy. I can't accept it. I can't believe in any creed of which the central doctrine is that God, who is joy, should have had to suffer. Perhaps it was so, in some inscrutable way, I believe it may have been so, but I don't understand how it was possible. So I leave it alone. My affair is joy. They had come to the weir above the village, and the thunder of riotous cool water was heavy in the air. Trees dipped into the translucent stream with slender, trailing branches, and the meadow where they stood was starred with midsummer blossomings. Larks shot up, carolling into the crystal dome of the blue, and a thousand voices of June sang round them. Frank, bareheaded, as was his wont, with his coat slung over his arm and his shirt sleeves rolled up above the elbow, stood there like some beautiful wild animal, with eyes half shut and mouth half open, drinking in the scented warmth of the air. Then suddenly he flung himself face downwards on the grass at the edge of the stream, burying his face in the daisies and cowslips, and lay stretched there in wide-armed ecstasy with his long fingers pressing and stroking the dewy herbs of the field. Never before had Darcy seen him thus fully possessed by his idea, his caressing fingers, his half-buried face pressed close to the grass. Even the clothed lines of his figure were instinct with a vitality that somehow was different from that of other men. And some faint glow from it reached Darcy, some thrill, some vibration from that charged, recumbent body passed to him, and for a moment he understood as he had not understood before, despite his persistent questions and the candid answers they received, how real, and how realised by Frank, his idea was. Then suddenly the muscles in Frank's neck became stiff and alert, and he half raised his head, whispering, "'The panpipes! The panpipes!' close, oh, so close. Very slowly, as if a sudden movement might interrupt the melody, he raised himself and leaned on the elbow of his bent arm. His eyes opened wider, the lower lids drooped as if he focused his eyes on something very far away, and the smile on his face broadened and quivered like sunlight on still water, till the exultance of its happiness was scarcely human. So he remained, motionless and rapt for some minutes. Then the look of listening died from his face, and he bowed his head, satisfied. "'Ah, oh, that was good,' he said. "'How is it possible you did not hear? "'Oh, you poor fellow, did you really hear nothing?' A week of this outdoor and stimulating life did wonders in restoring to Darcy the vigour and health which his weeks of fever had filched from him, and as his normal activity and higher pressure of vitality returned, he seemed to himself to fall even more under the spell which the miracle of Frank's youth cast over him. Twenty times a day he found himself saying to himself suddenly at the end of some ten minutes' silent resistance to the absurdity of Frank's idea, but it isn't possible, it can't be possible. And from the fact of his having to assure himself so frequently of this, he knew that he was struggling and arguing with a conclusion which already had taken root in his mind. For in any case a visible living miracle confronted him, since it was equally impossible that this youth, this boy, trembling on the verge of manhood, was thirty-five. Yet such was the fact. July was ushered in by a couple of days of blustering and fretful rain, and Darcy, unwilling to risk a chill, kept to the house. But to Frank this weeping change of weather seemed to have no bearing on the behaviour of man, and he spent his days exactly as he did under the suns of June, lying in his hammock, stretched on the dripping grass, or making huge rambling excursions into the forest, the birds hopping from tree to tree after him to return in the evening drenched and soaked, but with the same unquenchable flame of joy burning within him. "'Catch cold?' he would ask. "'I've forgotten how to do it, I think.' 
I suppose it makes one's body more sensible always to sleep out of doors. People who live indoors always remind me of something peeled and skinless. Do you mean to say you slept out of doors last night in that deluge? asked Darcy. And where, may I ask? Frank thought a moment. I slept in the hammock till nearly dawn, he said, for I remember the light blinked in the east when I awoke. Then I went... Where did I go? Oh, yes, to the meadow where the panpipes sounded so close a week ago. You were with me, do you remember? But I always have a rug if it's wet. And he went whistling upstairs. Somehow that little touch, his obvious effort to recall where he had slept, brought strangely home to Darcy the wonderful romance of which he was still the half-incredulous beholder. Sleep till close on dawn in a hammock, then the tramp, or probably scamper, underneath the windy and weeping heavens to the remote and lonely meadow by the weir. The picture of other such nights rose before him, Frank sleeping perhaps by the bathing place under the filtered twilight of the stars or the white blaze of moonshine, a stir and awakening at some dead hour, perhaps a space of silent, wide-eyed thought, and then a wandering through the hushed woods to some other dormitory, alone with his happiness, alone with the joy and the life that suffused and enveloped him, without other thought or desire or aim, except the hourly and never-ceasing communion with the joy of nature. They were in the middle of dinner that night, talking on indifferent subjects, when Darcy suddenly broke off in the middle of a sentence. "'I've got it,' he said. "'At last I've got it.' "'Congratulate you,' said Frank. "'But what?' "'The radical unsoundness of your idea. "'It is this. "'All nature from highest to lowest is full, crammed full of suffering. "'Every living organism in nature preys on another.' Yet in your aim to get close to, to be one with nature, you leave suffering altogether out. You run away from it. You refuse to recognise it. And you are waiting, you say, for the final revelation. Frank's brow clouded slightly. Well, he asked rather wearily. Cannot you guess, then, when the final revelation will be? In joy you are supreme, I grant you that. I did not know a man could be so master of it. You have learned, perhaps, practically all that nature can teach. And if, as you think, the final revelation is coming to you, it will be the revelation of horror, suffering, death, pain in all its hideous forms. Suffering does exist. You hate it and fear it. Frank held up his hand. Stop. Let me think, he said. There was silence for a long minute. That never struck me, he said at length. It is possible that what you suggest is true. Does the sight of Pan mean that, do you think? Is it that nature, take it altogether, suffers horribly, suffers to a hideous, inconceivable extent? Shall I be shown all the suffering? He got up and came round to where Darcy sat. "'If it is, so be it,' he said. "'Because, my dear fellow, I am near, so splendidly near to the final revelation. Today the pipes have sounded almost without pause. I have even heard the rustle in the bushes, I believe, of Pan's coming. I have seen, yes, I saw today the bushes pushed aside as if by a hand, and piece of a face not human, peered through. But I was not frightened. At least, I did not run away this time. He took a turn up to the window and back again. Yes, there is suffering all through, he said, and I have left it all out of my search. Perhaps, as you say, the revelation will be that, and in that case, it will be goodbye. I have gone on one line, I shall have gone too far along one road without having explored the other. But I can't go back now. I wouldn't if I could. Not a step would I retrace. In any case, whatever the revelation is, it will be God. I'm sure of that.
The rainy weather soon passed, and with the return of the sun, Darcy again joined Frank in long, rambling days. It grew extraordinarily hotter, and with the fresh bursting of life after the rain, Frank's vitality seemed to blaze higher and higher. Then, as is the habit of the English weather, one evening clouds began to bank themselves up in the west. The sun went down in a glare of coppery thunder rack, and the whole earth broiling under an unspeakable oppression and sultriness paused and panted for the storm. After sunset the remote fires of lightning began to wink and flicker on the horizon, but when bedtime came the storm seemed to have moved no nearer, though a very low, unceasing noise of thunder was audible. Weary and oppressed by the stress of the day, Darcy fell at once into a heavy, uncomforting sleep. He woke suddenly into full consciousness, with the din of some appalling explosion of thunder in his ears, and sat up in bed with racing heart. Then for a moment as he recovered himself from the panic land which lies between sleeping and waking, there was silence, except for the steady hissing of rain on the shrubs outside his window. But suddenly that silence was shattered and shredded into fragments by a scream from somewhere close at hand, outside in the black garden, a scream of supreme and despairing terror. Again, and once again it shrilled up, and then a babble of awful words was interjected, a quivering, sobbing voice that he knew said, "'My God! Oh, my God! Oh, Christ!' and then followed a little mocking, bleating laugh. Then was silence again. Only the rain hissed on the shrubs. All this was but the affair of a moment, and without pause either to put on clothes or light a candle, Darcy was already fumbling at his door-handle. Even as he opened it he met a terror-stricken face outside, that of the manservant who carried a light. "'Did you hear?' he asked. The man's face was bleached to a dull, shining whiteness. Yes, sir, he said. It was the master's voice. Together they hurried down the stairs and through the dining room, where an orderly table for breakfast had already been laid, and out onto the terrace. The rain for the moment had been utterly stayed, as if the tap of the heavens had been turned off and under the lowering black sky, not quite dark since the moon rode somewhere serene behind the conglomerated thunderclouds, Darcy stumbled into the garden, followed by the servant with the candle. The monstrous leaping shadow of himself was cast before him on the lawn. Lost and wandering odours of rose and lily and damp earth were thick about him, but more pungent was some sharp and acrid smell that suddenly reminded him of a certain chalet in which he had once taken refuge in the Alps. In the blackness of the hazy light from the sky and the vague tossing of the candle behind him, he saw that the hammock in which Frank so often lay was tenanted. A gleam of white shirt was there, as if a man sitting up in it. But across that there was an obscure dark shadow, and as he approached the acrid odour grew more intense. He was now only some few yards away, when suddenly the black shadow seemed to jump into the air, then came down with tappings of hard hoofs on the brick path that ran down the pergola, and with frolicsome skippings galloped off into the bushes. When that was gone, Darcy could see quite clearly that a shirted figure sat up in the hammock. For one moment, from sheer terror of the unseen, he hung on his step, and the servant joining him, they walked together to the hammock. It was Frank. He was in shirt and trousers only, and he sat up with braced arms. For one half-second he stared at them, his face a mask of horrible, contorted terror. His upper lip was drawn back so that the gums of the teeth appeared, and his eyes were focused not on the two who approached him, but on something quite close to him. His nostrils were widely expanded as if he panted for breath, and terror incarnate and repulsion and deadly anguish ruled dreadful lines on his smooth cheeks and forehead. Then, even as they looked, the body sank backwards, and the ropes of the hammock wheezed and strained. Darcy lifted him out and carried him indoors. Once he thought there was a faint convulsive stir of the limbs that lay with so dead a weight in his arms, but when they got inside, there was no trace of life. But the look of supreme terror and agony of fear had gone from his face. 
A boy, tired with play but still smiling in his sleep, was the burden he laid on the floor. His eyes had closed, and the beautiful mouth lay in smiling curves, even as when, a few mornings ago, in the meadow by the weir, it had quivered to the music of the unheard melody of Pan's pipes. Then they looked further. Frank had come back from his bath before dinner that night in his usual costume of shirt and trousers only. He had not dressed, and during dinner, so Darcy remembered, he had rolled up the sleeves of his shirt above the elbow. Later, as they sat and talked after dinner on the close sultriness of the evening, he had unbuttoned the front of his shirt to let what little breath of wind there was play on his skin. The sleeves were rolled up now, and the front of the shirt was unbuttoned, and on his arms and on the brown skin of his chest were strange discolorations, which grew momently more clear and defined, till they saw that the marks were pointed prints, as if caused by the hoofs of some monstrous goat that had leaped and stamped upon him. <laughs> ¶¶ 